computer. Um, good afternoon, um, folks. Um, I have the pleasure of having today uh, with me um, the well-known Mike Khan. Mike Khan is the person whose name probably does not require much introduction, one of the co-founders of the Scrum Alliance and one of the most uh, well-known, uh, one of the best known names in the industry who has coined the term Agile Agility Scrum. So um, I'm certainly very pleased to have him today. Uh, this is gonna be a very informal discussion. And by the way, my name is Gene Gendel. Um, so Mike, thank you for having, uh, thank you for being here. And yeah, uh, thanks for thanks for having me here, here Gene. I, I appreciate it, look forward to it. Yep. Um, so today's conversation, really, I, I would like to structure around one of the very um, interesting, very useful, I personally use it at least once a week, <laughs> artifacts that you have created at one point. And I would like to hear from the horse's mouth um, what it was for, uh, what made you think, uh, what, what kind of thinking you put into creating this artifact. And um, of course, uh, maybe I would like to have a unstructured, you know, unscripted dialogue with you about this. Specifically, I'm referring to the dedicated URL, dedicated website, um, laughable.com. <laughs> and for those of you that are not familiar with this spell, I'm just gonna share my screen for a minute so people can, people can see what we're referring to. And this is, um, hopefully you see it as well, right? Laughable.com. Absolutely, yeah. In, in fact, maybe we should keep it for a while so that you can refer, I can refer to it and you can refer to it together. Sure. Um, so uh, Mike, please tell me and tell others, I'm sure there will be people watching us, what went into building this? What kind of thinking went through your <laughs> mind? What, what exactly does this um, describe? Uh, what is it? And why is I it? Just, a, yeah. <laughs> I just like April Fool's Day jokes. Um, and that's how it started. Um, when I was a little kid, I grew up in Orange County, California, near Disneyland. It's about three miles from Disneyland where I grew up. And one morning, my dad said to my sister and me, he said, do you want to go to Disneyland? And today, and my, my sister and I were like, well, yeah, yeah, we'll go to Disneyland. And he said, okay, all you got to do is wash my car. After you wash my car, we'll go to Disneyland. And so my sister is two years younger than I am. We're probably like eight and six. We wash his car. And then he's like, no, no, I got to do the interior too. And so we wash the inside of his car and they're like, okay, let's go to Disneyland. And he's like, April fools. And that was uh, my introduction to April fool's day jokes. And I was like to the cruelness of my dad too. He's actually a really nice guy, but that was a cruel joke on an eight and six year old. And so I just grew up loving April fool's day jokes. And so I try to do something different, um, not every year, but kind of every other year I'll do something. And this was the one we did three or four years ago, just kind of poking fun at not, it wasn't meant to be in a mean way, just kind of poking fun at some of the uh, scaling frameworks in particular scaled agile where even if you don't read the scaled agile framework, you know, you read it, you just look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, what's all this? It's just so intense. There's so many elements to it. And again, you don't have to read it. You just look at it. It's like, whoa. And so we just wanted to kind of poke a little bit of fun at that, uh, uh, poked fun at scrum too in here too, instead of uh, sprinting, we talked about, you know, going slow and we talked about it strolling instead of sprinting. So just kind of poking some fun at some agile topics. And Mike, you're referring to the, you know, well-known, I, I called it a, I try to be very unbiased these, you know, the, for the next 30 minutes, I'll let you speak, but you're referring to this <laughs> scaled agile framework that has this monumental, all-inclusive um, yeah. diagram that pretty much has every, and everything under the sun. You know, if you go to for an interview and you want to have an agile dictionary next to you, you would <laughs> take it with you, right? So that's what you're referring to, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just very intense. It has everything in there. And I don't know what percentage of the of the scaled agile framework is in their picture. But um, man, kudos to the graphic designer that fit it all in there. But there's there's a lot in there. And it's just, um, you know, it just it's kind of intense to have that much to a what we want to have as a lightweight or agile process. And so we're just kind of making fun of that, I thought in a friendly way. I, I, I'm all with you. I also think irony and a bit of a sarcasm could go a long way as opposed to just, you know, criticizing and bashing something. We can just make, you know, fun out of this uh, whole um, situation. Yeah. I have some specific questions. So I'm obviously, um, you know, I refer to this quite a bit and uh, it's semi-animated 
uh, uh, website. It's it's a web page. I can hover over some of these uh, nuggets, and it actually gives me a um, you know additional verbiage. So. What specifically strikes me, and we talk about scaling, right? And our organizational design is the first order factor that defines, you know, organizational agility in my view. And when we look at something that's very big, very monumental, so, so heavy, it, it becomes, you know, almost questionable. What, what, what exactly, are we scaling goodness? Are we scaling something that is really lean, um, agile, or are we just amplifying the existing complexity as is? So I wonder, what are your thoughts about this uh, framework with respect to uh, systemic organizational agility as we would like to see it? I mean, does it help it or does it? Well, I think that's a that's a good question from a couple of different perspectives. Um, one would be that if I were to look, at, I mean, a general issue, I can't think of everything in, in any framework, but if I were to look at just about any element of scaled agile framework, it's probably a good idea. But you take 400, I'm just making that up, you take 400 good ideas, and it's like, whoa, I'm not sure this is a good idea anymore. And so it's just a lot. And to me, it's very analogous to the old rational unified process, which a lot of good ideas in there. But what happened is people would look at it and what they were supposed to do was to strip out and only do the parts they truly needed. But people would look at it and go, oh, that's a good document. That's a good meeting. We should do that too. And they'd end up with an overly heavy process for their unified process again, 20 years ago. The same thing is what I see with scaled agile teams today. They'll look at this and go, wow, this is all great stuff. A lot of great ideas in here. And they're sincerely are. But then instead of stripping out enough, they leave a few too many things in there and end up with an overly heavyweight process. And so that kind of gets in the way of being agile um, as much as they should be. What I've noticed that's interesting about scaled agile today and what you're describing, you know, asking about, is this a good thing? Is a handful of years ago, I would meet teams that would, you know, maybe going back three, four years, they would say, yeah, we did scaled agile and it didn't work. And it's like kind of frustrating. And now we got to pick our new process and try to really get agile. They were frustrated by the experience. Today, I'm meeting more teams that are quite happy they did scaled agile framework. Um, but their attitude is like, okay, we did that. It wasn't where we want to be, but it really helped us see how beneficial being truly agile would be. And so they're looking at it like it was a very good or kind of necessary for them first step. And now they're kind of moving away, but going with um, a wider way process. And again, perfectly fine process for some organizations, but uh, not everything in there is gonna be needed by, by everybody. Thank you for that. Uh, it's funny, what you just described sounds like uh, when you were, you know, when you were, uh, raise a child, sometimes instead of telling them not to do it, don't, don't do it, don't do it, actually let them do it. Let them do it um, so that they don't necessarily hurt themselves badly, but they yep. actually step on those rakes, let them let it slam in, in, in the forehead and okay, it doesn't feel right. Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. That's a good uh, point. That's a good point. I did that years ago. I remember sitting at a park with my wife and our daughter who was probably three at the time. And my daughter is climbing on something and my wife leans over to me and says, she's going to fall. And I said, yes, she is. And I think my wife wanted me to get up and get her. And yep, my daughter fell off and, uh, you know, just scraped herself. She was only like three feet up in the air, scraped herself and learned when mom warns you, be careful, you better listen. So you also mentioned something interesting. So it's like a la carte of some great things, great ideas, picked like 400 things, right? It's like 400, maybe, maybe fewer, maybe more. Yep. Um, all of them are very, could be very useful. Not, not Maybe not all, but many of them are very useful. But when you, it's like creating a jambalaya, right? You put everything in one big bowl and you start boiling it. Um, will you really have the taste you need? And do you feel that there was maybe some, there was, a, there was an element of sunk cost fallacy that, hey, we have invested in this heavy um, lumbering um, effort we must be using every single piece of it. Otherwise, we're not going to make our money worth. Do you think there is also a psych psychological factor for companies that have used it or have a, you know installed it? think so. I don't think people get, you know, I think it's pretty easy to drop a part of the process, right? I think it's more that it's like, okay, experts have said this is a good thing. Let's go trust them. And you look at it and, it's a, and it is a good thing, right? Doing this would be a good thing, but not if you're also doing this and that and the other thing. And it just ends up being too much. I like your, um, your jambalaya example. I'm thinking about, I love spicy 
but I like all sorts of spices. And I'm like, one of my goals this week, kind of mm-hmm. clean out my spice cabinet and just have too many things there. And you know, I'll have like three things of bay leaves or something. I just want to kind of clean it out. And I'm thinking about cooking something tonight and putting in a little bit of everything I own. Um, and you're right, it's not going to taste very good, right? It's all going to conflict and it's not going to be what I want. So I think it was just too much. It's just too much. Yep. Uh, yep. Thank you for that. So uh, more specifically, and so I, as, as I have been strolling th- through your uh, railway, and for those that uh, <laughs> will be watching, let's, let, me, let me just very uh, slowly st- stroll from planning to strolling to stabilization, which is another amazing part, right? Uh, how many stabilizing springs do we need to get something out to production? Um, what really strikes me, and this is really near and dear to my heart, because when I talk about, when, when I work with teams and organizations, I spend a lot of time discussing local optimization and, mm-hmm. um, and emissions with uh, multiplicity um, of backlogs. So you are explicitly <laughs> making a notion of a team backlog. Then there's a personal backlog. <laughs> there was uh, scrolling down somewhere. So another, like there was a product backlog. Oh, here was a yep. backlog yeah. <laughs> of backlogs. So too many backlogs. Um, you know, clearly every backlog is optimized for its own need and purpose. Um, you know, overall, probably not too much visibility. <laughs> I don't want to anchor too much with, you know, what are your thoughts? I mean, so many backlogs in general, what does it typically lead to? And what, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's, you know, in the world today, it's really hard in some organizations to determine what's the product. And we have to know what the product is before we can do a product backlog. And I'll do a little exercise sometimes. I'll bring up uh, an Amazon homepage and I'm like, what's the product? And I actually was doing this in a class a while back and I took a screenshot, like I knew I was gonna do it that day. So I just grabbed a screenshot like an hour before it came up in class. And it was probably the perfect day to do it because it had things like Amazon handyman services. It had like sign up for Amazon Prime. Um, I think they recently bought Whole Foods. So there was a thing on there about the Whole Foods grocery delivery. Um, there's a little link on there about um, hosting. Um, just uh, on, you could buy like a technology, buy like a new uh, network attached storage, hire somebody to come out and install it for you. Now, all of these things were all over that one screenshot that I grabbed. And so what is the product? And we have to address that before we figure out what the what what product backlog should exist and now amazon i mean i just listed a bunch of things they all probably sound like different products and they probably all are but i was working with an airline where this was like seriously an ongoing debate for a year what is our product there were some people in the airline that said our product is we move people from here to there we're like a bus we just we move people that's that's what we do and they weren't, you know, they weren't putting it down. It was just like, it's a really simple thing, move. Um, and then there were other people in the same company going, yeah, but that's too big to be a useful definition of a product. We do that, but we, we also sell tickets. We also track aircraft maintenance. We also let crew members select the flights they want to work on based on seniority and other factors. And so they were looking at it as like, you know, four or five products, but even an airline with four or five products, those are big products for, uh, uh, you know, an organization that big. So figuring out what is the product is kind of the first step. And then identifying what, what level we should have a product backlog exist for that is, uh, it's a non-trivial discussion in a lot of organizations. Uh, so wholeheartedly, you know, sounds very strong to me and very, and I'm, I'm in strongly in agreement with you. And uh, what begs the question also sounds like, uh, this is, I'm just trying to validate with the, with you. It sounds like understanding what our product is, is super critical from the very beginning. Yeah. And if we don't have a good understanding of what our product is and who is speaking, who is actually, who are we asking really matters. Uh, with these more complex, more heavy, you know, lumbering frameworks, sounds like uh, companies start with first installing the framework with all of its nuggets and, and, and moving parts. And then um, they are scratching their heads trying to figure out how to define a product as opposed to scaling up goodness. Yeah. I, 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 what are your thoughts on that? I mean, may, I've, sp- I've spoken to qu- quite a few teams that uh, have been using s- SAFE and uh, you know, it's hard to find a true cross-functional, um, you know, team of, 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 of multifaceted full stack developers that work on a product, mostly projects, programs, pro, some activities. 
So right. what are your thoughts on that? Um, maybe it relates to the product conversation also. Uh, the, the back backlog product. I'm sorry. Backlog. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I don't know that how much of that I would blame on on Safe is just the nature of the type of projects that Safe would match with. Um, you know, if you're a if, if you're a company doing huge things and you got all these kind of interconnected products, um, that's a tough challenge. And I think what what you're describing is where a lot go wrong, which is like they have a vague understanding, of course, of what their products are. Right? Of course, we know what our products are, but. Um, we then pick a process, we put that process in place, and then it might start to change our definition of, of how we think about a product, right? Would the airline be better off thinking about, oh, it's just one product, or, you know, is that just nuts? It's just so big. An example for me is thinking about any sort of like Microsoft Office, Google Office, right? It, you know, they're sold as a package, right? But, you know, we probably have somebody in charge of Excel, somebody in charge of PowerPoint, somebody in charge of Word, and probably worth thinking about those things as individual products, although it is one bigger product, it's one product suite. And so I don't think there's a real simple answer. So I think that's where it gets hard when we've picked our process or our framework before we've really defined what the product is, because we should know what the product is and then pick the right framework for that. And that's, I think, where a lot of organizations will go astray with this. Yep. Thank you for that. Thank you for this clarification, Mike. Uh, another thing that really strikes me, and I, I keep coming back to this um, all the time, is the notion of pair management. Like we know, uh, we obviously know well, um, a, a lot about pair programming. This is a great you know, engineering technique to cross pollinate and learn from each other for two developers. So what did you really mean by when, was it, when you created this um, cartoon, you know, part of the cartoon is pair managing and you got managers and managers of managers and uh, uh, you know, <laughs> some other you know, managerial roles. Well, how does it relate to? <laughs> I think it's, it's just the next natural step, right? If if we look at it and we say pair programming is valuable, and I, I strongly believe it is, if we think pair programming is valuable, why don't we have two managers supervising every employee, right? And, you know, finish this, finish this. And obviously it's silly, but, um, you know, it seems like a natural outgrowth of that type of thinking, right? Let's pair up and how we manage people. And, um, we, you know, what's interesting about that is when I'll, when I'm teaching or giving a, a, a lecture at a conference or something, I might make some little joke about pair managing. And I've kind of stopped because nobody gets it. Nobody gets it. Um, and it's kind of like it's too close to the truth, right? It's like, yes, I do have two managers um, over me. And, you know, they're thinking I'm like, you know, matrix organization, and I've got two managers. And so it gets a little too close to home, I think, to, to be a good joke when I might try to make it at a at a conference or in a, in a course session. So, um, but that was the idea is like, you know, when, if, if it's good to pair when we program, let's have two managers supervising everything you do, which, oh man, that'd be, that'd be, that'd be like my worst nightmare. So. Yeah, but it's interesting though, when, it's, when you say this, so pair managing or, or managing, uh, of managing managers, there was also a good old, I think cartoon, of, you know, from Dr. Seuss, right? The, the monks watching each other and there's a one worker bee that is actually collecting honey and there are so many different managers, you know, so many different watchers, bee watchers or bee watcher or bee watcher. Um, I wonder, uh, so come, you know, taking this back to the framework, to the scaled uh, agile framework, it sounds like there are quite a few managers. If we look for the, uh, at the authentic diagram and maybe this is something we, I just wanna have it, you know, here, I guess if you Google, you will have so many different diagrams. There are there, 2.0, you know, different versions, variations. 5.0 is the latest one. There are quite a few managerial roles. So begs the question: Do you have a feeling maybe that it's almost like if you take the traditional organization with its roles uh, and responsibilities with a more heavy, more uh, you know, complex framework, there is a chance that those very managers will most likely end up in a very similar lateral managerial role, maybe a, with a different title. I, think I haven't paid a lot of attention to which managers exist in, in uh, scaled agile. So that part's hard for me to know, but you know, managers in general, it's, it's tough. I remember talking to Ken Schwaber, who's kind of the, I call him the godfather of Scrum, the first guy to really write about it yep. and, and talk about it. And I remember talking to him one time many, many years ago, and I was talking to him about, you know, why, why'd you call it Scrum Master? Like, what a weird title. Why'd you call it that? And um, part of it had to do with if you don't change enough about somebody's job, they're not going to change their behavior. 
And so he had to come up with like this totally new title to get people to work in a totally new way. And, um, you know, we go in and we have managers and if we don't change that management title at all, they end up falling a little bit too much into their old habits, even though they might understand, I need to be less directive. I need to coach the team. I need to get the best out of the team, empower the team, servant leader. They may totally get it, but if we don't change enough about their title, they fall back into old habits. I've witnessed this, uh, you know, many, many times with managers that I had reporting to me in organizations where I was uh, employed, not like a consultant like now. But where I had managers reporting to me, they would fall back into those habits unless I had changed the job title. And that was kind of how that conversation with Ken came up 20 years ago. Yep, that's that's that's. Thank you for bringing this up. This is this is actually a very important history that many 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 people forget. They don't even remember where from where and why the the role of the scrum master was uh, initially introduced. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, you have this listed not as a scrum master, as a uh, <laughs> stroll master. So we, I get it, we're strolling down the uh, railway. But what's that? What, what's the uh, what's the irony behind your uh, stroll master role here? If you don't mind sharing, it's kind of like I said, I'll make fun of anything, and it was you know, it was just meant to be an April April Fool's joke. And so instead of a a scrum master and with scrum with this idea of a sprint. I wanted to slow it down. Like, you know, most teams are not sprinting. They're not going that fast. And so I wanted to kind of just talk about strolling. So, you know, we're going to go more slowly, kind of walk master, stroll master, and uh, just kind of poking fun of how fast we're going. And most teams are not sprinting. And it was also kind of pointing out the idea that I'm not wild about the term sprint. Um, I love scrum. I think scrum's fantastic. It's a big part of my life and it has been for many years. But, uh, you know, some of the vocabulary is a little bit weird. And sprint is one of the words I'm not a big fan of, because when we do a sprint, it sounds like we're supposed to finish and, you know, you're out of breath and you need to recover. And that leads to teams wanting to take, well, they take gap weeks, right? They run a sprint, take a week, run a sprint, take a week. And that's, you know, well known to not be a good thing these days. So there's not as many teams doing that, but that has been historically more common. And, you know, I want people running at a, uh, what Kent Beck called a sustainable pace, right? We just keep doing it. We go one sprint to the next. And, I don't know. I can't go sprint for very long, uh, but I could go for a long stroll. I could go for a stroll all day. Um, I could go for a sprint for, you know, a minute. Um, and so I kind of wanted to, you know, just kind of poke fun at that and just use a different term. I don't think we should call it stroll masters in real scrum. That <laughs> sounds too slow, but uh, it's probably just as bad as calling it a sprint in some ways. Uh, I understand. In fact, I'll be honest. When I saw this stroll master with, you know, in, in, in a pilot, wearing a pilot's glasses and, uh, and almost <laughs> like a weep leash, it felt like, okay, this, this poor soul is, is, is being put in charge of a team and, uh, he or she is, in this case, it's probably it's a him, being mandated to squeeze, you know, capacity and, and output out of a team. So it's really not a, the role of an enabler and facilitator. No. <laughs> it's more of a, of a enforcer, which we oftentimes see with large corporations. They just relabel old roles into new roles. Um, yep. And then right next to the to the stroll mess, there is an architect uh, at the what is it, the castle or ivory a, tower it was meant to be an ivory I, tower. The ivory right? tower, bingo! Yeah. I, I, yeah. So you beat me. So I have a dedicated cartoon for this, uh, the ivory tower. Could you tell a little more? Could you say a little more about that? What's the architecture power tower? But for the me, ivory... for me, it's about you know the architect is a fine role. Let me back up on that. A lot of times we'll talk about we don't want roles on a scrum project, right? You know, we're just all a team member. 100% on board with that. Absolutely on board with that. But people have kind of unofficial roles, right? And so somebody might be on the team and it's like, look, you're our, you're our architect. You're the most senior tech person. Somebody else who's been a tester before and loves testing is the best at testing. Yes, we want to call them a team member. But whenever there's a testing task, that's what they're grabbing. And so I do acknowledge that we have that on Scrum projects. Everybody's a team member, but we do have specialties. And so the architect for me is somebody who should be involved in the project. They're not in their ivory tower saying, make it this way. I don't have to do it myself, but here's how I want you to do it. And so they need to be, they need to be involved. So I like your sheriff analogy here. Yeah, and, uh, and 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 I'm sorry, I'm kind of self-serving here a little. I'm so That's great, so emotional about the same. And when I saw your, uh, you know, image of the power tower architect, I was like, oh man, 
that's got to be like <laughs> it's such a such a revelation for me. Thank you for um, sharing this. And, well, you had uh, it right there. You had another mandate from the ivory tower right on the on the right side of your image, right? So that, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Right there. So yeah. Uh, so uh, I, so let me see. Uh, we got. Um, I have one more question that is really you know really backs. I need to ask it. So I know you are very big and. Uh, You've put some great stuff out there on estimation, and um, I've used over years, even rescribed re some of your speaking on estimation, capacity driven estimation, velocity driven estimation. There's some great stuff out there on that produced by you. So Thank I you. wonder, uh, yeah, and this is just you know reflecting on what I've seen of what I have used. Uh, question to you, somewhat loaded question. So assuming that we um, are really good at, you know, estimating work. Um, and, you know, we use work uh, estimation for forecasting. And if we do it really well enough um, at scale, we can in fact use it for um, uh, dynamic rolling wave, uh, rolling wave budgeting. Mm -hmm. That is if we of course um, use maybe scrum or cross-functional feature teams that not, not only deliver out, um, out, um, output, but also outcome because that outcome should translate into something tangible, uh, something that we can maybe you know, translate over time into, uh, into money, uh, RRI. So with large, more complex frameworks, like if you take any one of these developers and testers, I wonder to what degree, and I wanna share your, I, I would like to hear your view on this. When you have too many component teams, classic traditional component teams, uh, managed by component managers or component leads, uh, delivering not features, but uh, slices of a feature, components. Uh, to what extent does, um, you know, to what extent does it really make sense to measure velocities and, and, and make estimates? How much value does an organization get out of this? Well, I think it's fine to measure velocity from a component team. I Personally, I think we overdo the, the hatred of, of output in favor of outcome. I think we overstate that um, because I don't meet that many teams that are clueless. Right? Most teams know they're there to achieve some goal and they, they know that it's about the outcome. I mean, I've rarely, I don't know if I've ever had that conversation with somebody and they're like, wow, never thought of that before. It might be new phrasing or new words to them or a new way of thinking about it, but people know it's about achieving some sort of outcome, but we have to create some sort of output to create the outcome. And so for me, it's about leading and lagging measures. And the output is a leading measure of something. And the outcome is the lagging measure. We get it after we've done the thing. And so I'm not as opposed to looking at outputs as others are. Yes, it's easy to make silly examples of where it would be horrible and, and things like that. And um, I totally get those things, but I don't see many teams doing that in practice. And so a component team, I think is fine. I think it's okay to measure their, um, measure their velocity. I mean, I, I think that's as meaningful as a feature team's velocity. Still doesn't mean we delivered any features. It's just kind of how fast a team is going. We have to then assume that the team knows the right things to build. Um, and if they do, they're going to eventually achieve the outcome that they were that they were desirous of. So I'm not opposed to it. A lot of team, a lot of people these days seem to get really down on component teams. And um, I'm not I'm not as adamant against component teams. There's a um, here's my view on component teams in general. There's an old um, scientist, some people know him named Richard Feynman. Um, and uh, he's a, a Nobel Prize winner, brilliant uh, physicist, and he's written a number of books. He's, he died years ago, but he's written a number of books that were really good. One was like, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. Great book. In one of his books, he tells this story about how he realized he was just kind of like wasting brain cells deciding what to have for dessert. It's like, you know, he's this really smart guy. Why waste energy deciding what to have for dessert? And he decided from then on the rest of his life, he would have vanilla ice cream for dessert. Anytime he was offered ice cream, it's vanilla ice cream. And his theory was like, how wrong can you go, right? I mean, it's it's still really good and uh, he doesn't have to think about it. And I have seen stuff, you know, over the last 10 years or so where we've seen stuff about decision fatigue and, you know, it's why it gets hard to make decisions. That's why, you know, you talk to somebody and like, 
hey, where do you want to go to dinner tonight? And they've made decisions all day and they don't want to make that decision. And he was kind of onto that by saying, I'm just going to say vanilla ice cream. And so I like to use that as my thought about component versus feature teams. I want somebody's default answer to be, I'm going to have a feature team. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to have a feature team. But then when you say that, if you look at it, you're like, no, that's wrong. I, I really, I really, really, really want a component team here. Go for it, right? Richard Feynman told this story. Did he, I don't know if he, always ate vanilla ice cream the rest of his life. I doubt it, right? He's probably at some restaurant and somebody's like, Richard, the lemon cake is good. You got to try the lemon cake. He's like, okay, I'll have the lemon cake. I didn't take any time to make that decision. So I want the default to be a feature team. But if you look at it, you're like, no, I really need a component here. I think component teams are okay. We just don't want to overdo it. And a lot of large projects do tend to overdo it. Um, I think in part because programmers like being on component teams. I always liked being on a component team as a as a coder. So um, I, I want to favor feature teams, but not to the exclusion always of component teams. Thank you for that. Thanks, Mike. Mike, I know we're almost out of time. So I'm going to ask you one question just to sum this up. And of course, if you have another minute or two to ask or make any additional comments, you're more than welcome to. Yeah, we have a little um, bit more. Yeah, it, great. So um, it's almost like a true or false, right? So especially when it comes to organizations and their appetite to scale, scale, we need to scale because we're big. We, if, we, if I'm 500,000 man operation, I must be scaling. Well, truth be told, in order to scale, you have to have goodness to start with. When organizations fall into the trap of um, you know, just making things bigger, they may end up scaling um, deficiencies, inefficiencies and emissions. And then we end up with so many more in emissions to the power of. Um, so what are your thoughts on, on just trying to get things right at the very basic rudimentary level, or at least um, having a good sense of what good feels like? So nailing before scaling kind of thing. What are your thoughts on that? I like that. I like your phrase, nailing before scaling. I like that. Um, I would want to do that mostly. I don't think I want to get it perfect before I start scaling, because one of the things that you can do when you start to have multiple teams is take advantage of that as a way to experiment, right? What would it be like if we tried three-week sprints? What would it be like if we didn't have a scrum master at all? What would it be like if we uh, uh, didn't do an end of the sprint retrospective and we talked about it for five minutes, if needed, every day during the daily scrum? I don't know if any of these are good or bad ideas, but they're experiments. And so I wouldn't want to put off all experiment until we've nailed it. And I know you're going to agree with that, right? But, you know, think about your, your statement, nail it before you scale it. You don't mean get it 100% right, right? You know, it's exactly. like nobody's ever done that, right? I mean, nobody's ever got it 100% right. And so, you know, get it close, get it close to nailing it before you scale it. So I don't think you have to get it perfect, but get it far enough along that you know what you're doing. Though The way I explain that to clients these days is basically this. It's like, look, it's, it's 2021 right now. We know Agile works. What we don't know is what good Agile looks like in this company. And that's what we have to find out. So let's start experimenting to figure out what good Agile looks like here. Is it one week sprints? Is it four? Is it, is it Kanban? Is it scaled Agile? I don't know, right? Let's start the experiments and figure that out. So I'd want to start doing that a little bit early before we got too dialed in on what the process was. And I appreciate making this. Thank you, brother, for this. I appreciate you making this delineation. We don't necessarily need to re, re, redo all every single experiment that we have a long track record of. Like if we have 500, 600, 600 experiments documented already, so you kind of know what to expect. So let's, you know, you want to inspect and adapt within the body of knowledge that has been collected before you, but certainly not, uh, you know, jump feet first and try to, you know, uh, revamp everything from scratch. So, yeah, we build on what's that. gone before. Well, yeah, we, we, yeah. that's, the, that's what science is for, right? So we don't have to do this again. Good point. Um, yeah. So, um, I think you've really, you know, we touched upon the very, um, you know, very important, um, elements of what, what, what I really had the itch to ask those questions <laughs> of you. I really appreciate you giving clarification to some of the things that went into this, of course. Uh, Bex to ask, of course, the 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 train itself. <laughs> and <laughs> what is it, you know, what is it, is it, does it have to do anything with the train or, you know, training? Or, <laughs> um, um, I think it's scale agile. There was a, there was a notion of a, 
um, train, right? There was, uh, was it a yeah. train? Yeah, the agile release train. It was just kind of, you know, making fun of that term, right? Just in the same way that I'm going to make fun of sprints. I want to call them strolls, right? So it wasn't anything negative meant by that. Um, it's just, uh, you know, you, you call something a train in your process. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at a way to make fun of it. And what do exactly. trains do? They crash, right? And that's that's kind of perfect in a, in a software context. The, so. the intention, yeah, the intention, everything has to be contextual. So we can make fun of anything, right? We can, yeah. The, the most genuine and authentic thing, what really matters is what stands behind it and why we're making a joke. Yep. Um, look, I, I really uh, appreciate your time. I, I think uh, this was a great uh, uh, unscripted dialogue. <laughs> that was, we were both concerned that this would this could become uh, more of a you know prep work. It was not was not really prepped. It was like ad hoc sh shooting from the hip, and I appreciate you doing this. Um, thanks, thanks, Jane. I appreciate being here. It was fun. If you, if you want to have any like the you know if you want to have a closing sentence or two to the audience, I'll try to share it with some of my audience uh, that I'm sure they follow you and they know who you are. <laughs> Do you want to say anything? Uh, I think that. I think the biggest thing is just where we were, which is that, you know, um, start, do the simplest thing that looks like it's going to work and then add to that um, as you as you discover you need more rather than, um, you know, reading a, a book. It doesn't have to be scaled as well, reading a book and going, wow, here are 100 great ideas. No, go grab 10 of them and get started with that small subset and then kind of iterate towards agility. Right. It doesn't have to be a place we start. We iterate to becoming agile. We don't start there. Great. Well, thank you, Mike. Thank you. And uh, so th uh, thank you, everyone who will be watching us. And um, once again, um, as my guest today, I had the uh, very well known and respected Mike Khan, the association with the Mountain Goat software, if anyone watches it. And uh, some of it's some of Mike's great um, artifacts and books out there on user stories applied and, and similar uh, content that he has produced, I highly recommend it. So uh, my personal thank you, Mike, and uh, Thanks, Gene. we'll see each other around. Cheers. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That seemed to go well.